Okay, picking up where we left off, we're on page 478 looking at that uh, goofy little diagram of uh, figure 10-23. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is a really good description of the difference between a DSS and an, M an MIS. I kind of went, I, I told you the gist of it. The gist of it is MIS is really are for the current and the past and decisions are practically about the future. So let's look at this emphasis line first, okay? Before we get started. MIS typically emphasizes the information that they currently have and emphasize actual decisions and decision-making processes. Okay, this is a good list. I'm not gonna go down the entire list here in lecture because you can read, you got eyeballs, but this is fertile ground for lots of questions. Can you imagine which of the following are true of uh, the differences between a DSS and an MIS. Doesn't that sound like a good test question to you? Yeah. Okay. So lots of good stuff here. And do read it because most likely you're going to be tested on it. Okay. Let's continue. The next thing I talk about is the, the, the parts of a decision support system. Okay. The components. And um, they kind of go off in a little bit of a bizarre tangent here. So just kind of bear with me because some of this is kind of weird. So here's the, the conceptual model. Um, so one is the database. So I have a database and this is an awful lot like data mining. You know, typically this database would probably be like pulling extracts of information from other pieces. If, you know, your decision support system could be so well integrated that it, it just dips down into your corporate data, but most likely it's, it's working on summarized data someplace, okay. The model base, now this is a strange term. So the model base basically is saying, what kind of model are we doing? Are we doing like a financial model or a statistical or perhaps one of those geographic information system kind of things, you know, one of those? And then they what they come, come across is this thing called a model management software. And so, Model management, whoops, I'm still on databases. Model management software typically says, okay, I'm gonna pull from this and I'm gonna use these set of tools. Now, their examples here are kind of dumb, but what they're basically saying, okay, just bear with them. Um, if you're doing a financial model, it probably is going to pull out and either use or produce an Excel spreadsheet. So the model, the, the, the uh, model management software knows how to pull up a statistical thing or how to pull up PowerPoint or how to do this. You know, it knows how to do that. So basically it's like the traffic cop. Hey, oh, I see you're making, it's like Clippy. Oh, I see you're making a, a letter to grandma. Let me help. That's what it's all about. The next thing they talk about is the user interface. Now you might think this is not a critical thing. It's like, okay, look, all applications have a user interface. Why are we even bothering to talk about this? <sighs> okay. The cruel fact of life is those people who are fantastic managers, I mean, they are great people, people, and, uh, you know, they got all the right kind of skills. They may or may not be, have the critical skills to be able to run these things well. So we need to dumb down the user interface. Now, I hate to say that because I'm kind of painting a broad brush here and tell, tell, what I'm basically telling you is all oh, managers are idiots. No, of course they're not idiots. I'm just saying that we, when you hired that manager, you didn't hire him for his computer skills, okay? You hired him because he was a dang good manager. Okay, so we can overlook the fact that they may not be up to snuff on every single thing dealing with automation. So they do have to dumb down this thing and they try to make it as... Um, as user friendly as possible and, and instead of having them you know select from table employees where over time you know instead of having you know sql kind of queries it's kind of like near english kind of queries so they spend an awful lot of time trying to figure this thing out okay the next thing to talk about is group support system so a group support system is a type of dss it's not separate it's just a type of decision support system that instead of providing all the information to a single manager who's going to make a decision, you submit all this information to a group and the group collectively comes up with a recommendation. So there's an awful lot of companies that do spend a great deal of time 
trying to make sure that we don't have autocratic decisions made by people up up the chain who have no idea what the heck's going on in the trenches. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Okay, so group support systems are kind of what this is all about. So I have a group support system and it looks almost like the other diagram. It's got a database, it's got a, uh, a model base, it's got external data, and it's got a user interface, right? It looks kind of sort of the same as the other. Okay, the only real difference is that there's some specialized hardware and software involved in this thing. Okay. So let's talk about them. So how does this actually work? For Typically there's a, a special design for these things. For example, I remember one that I played with where it's almost like a game show set up where everyone had a little station and uh, you had like a buzzer you could hit, right? And you, you'd hit the buzzer to, to vote on things and you'd hit the little buzzer to, to you know, ask Mother May I or you know, ask questions. So specialized ways of, of interacting with the group. And so, yeah, special hardware, special software. Usually it's going to be something displayed up on the screen going on and, you know, multiple conversations going on simultaneously. So these guys have to be kind of ease of use because most likely if you got invited to one of these decision support system groups, right, uh, this is probably the first time you've ever used a decision support system in your entire life. And we don't have the time to you know, give you an instruction manual on you, when you walk in the door because we're ready to start working immediately. So it's got to be easy to use. It's got to be pretty doggone flexible because again, the manufacturers have no idea what the heck you're going to be using this thing for. Obviously, the decision support part is important. Now, they, they go off on some tangents talking about the types of, of choices. Like when you set one of these things up, you can choose to use different approaches. The Delphi approach, which is you have a panel of people who are experts and you use them to query. Brainstorming, you've probably heard these terms. Brainstorming where people can just blurt out, hey, I think we need to do this. And Group consensus, you know, is it gonna be majority rules or is it gonna be one of those things where everyone has to agree? You know, you need to come up with these rules ahead of time. So that's kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> there's another one called nominal group technique. I've never actually played with it, but it's, it's, it's a more structured, it's, it's kind of sort of like consensus, but slightly, I mean, uh, brainstorming. But it's a, uh, it's a little more structured, and you know, there's a you know a moderator that kind of makes sure that everyone's participating, and there's lots of other things involved. Multi voting, you know, when it comes time, okay, I think we've got a solution. How many people think this is the what we ought to do? And so, and, and typically this is anonymous. Typically you wouldn't be able to see, you know, look over and look to see what your what your compadre is voting. You know, it's supposed to be completely anonymous. Okay. So, on page 485, we talk about the good stuff, starting right here with anonymous input. Okay, why do I point that out? Because I'm more interested in this section, and this is most likely where test questions would come from if you had half a brain. Okay, anonymous input, this is important. In a regular de decision support system, this is, this is a non-issue. But in a group support system, I don't want the other people to know that I'm voting for or against. How about this? Okay, how about this? Let's say that you have a bonus system, okay, in your organization. And it's time to decide whether or not, you know, Bobby is going to get a bonus, okay? And so you put together a group, okay? I do not want Bobby to know that I voted against him, okay? Right? So, when I'm making these voting decisions, I don't want anyone else in the room to see that I voted yes or no, and I certainly don't want... Bobby to know that I, I did approve or didn't approve his bonus. Cool? Okay, let's move on. The reduction of negative group behavior. I've seen this where, you know, groups go off on a wild tangent or one person dominates and you really kind of need a traffic cop. You need a person, you need a moderator or facilitator, whatever the right term would be, you know, the very kind of quietly, you know, get everybody focused and back on track and kind of moving along. So the software can actually help that. They can put like time limits on stuff, you know, where you can say, it'll go ding, okay, your time is up, you know, move on to the next person for them to talk. You know, there's lots of things that software can do to help reduce negative behavior. Negative behavior of individuals and, believe it or not, negative behavior of groups because, you know, there's nothing worse than, you know, getting a bunch of people together to make a bad decision. Okay. So, I like this. So, read this about, read this section about anonymous input. Read the section about 
uh, negative. The next one is parallel communication. Typically, in one of these systems, it kind of sort of allows two people to talk. I'm not talking about verbally, but two people to carry on a discussion at the same time. In other words, it's okay to have like two conversations going up on the screen. I mean, not verbally, because that would be kind of distractive. But yes, I need to have parallel communication. So all sorts of various issues happening simultaneously. And you could kind of, I saw one where the moderator says, well, let's split that off and boop, on the screen, it came out at two little discussions. It was like a chat board, okay? So the chat board's going along and so, and the moderator says, let's split that. It goes, boing. And so this chat continued over here because they were talking about what color to make the car. And then over here, this continued on because what price they wanted to make the car as an example. Okay. Um, automated record keeping. It is very important that you archive all this stuff. And, and because later on, somebody's going to say, well, how the heck did you guys come up with that? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And you can say, no, 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 no. You know, here's what happened. Now, again, you have to be careful with that anonymous input part. But yeah, record keeping is an extraordinarily powerful part. Uh, not just the output, not just here's the answer, all the things it took to get there. Because somebody's going to have to revisit this probably the next year and say, okay, that worked great. Now let's do it again. Okay, let's continue. The next thing to talk about is like the hardware and software, the actual nuts and bolts to make this thing work. And this really isn't all that important, but um, let's just talk about it. So, um, yes, there's some, some stuff that, you know, Microsoft and there's... You know, Open Mind, Teamware. I've seen lots of these things. I think I've actually used this one. I think. I don't really remember. Anyway, lots of good stuff. So the things to think about here is what else it has to do. So this is kind of a weird way of looking at it. it is well, doggone it. Okay. In addition to the normal decision support system we just talked about. We need some sort of like group scheduling support. In other words, I need to be able to say, everyone, let's get together again and have, you know, I, I, I'm using used to using Microsoft Outlook in a corporate environment where you could look up everyone's schedules and, and find a spot where everyone is free, you know, group scheduling. Project management software, that'd be kind of cool to have. Document sharing, that's kind of another interesting way. So if I throw a document out on a, on a shared drive or perhaps a SharePoint server or something. And the holy grail of all this has always been multiple people could be working on the same document at the same time. We're not, we're barely just now getting to that point. So those are all good things that these tools can provide. Okay, now we can move on talking about the alternatives. This is an interesting discussion because some of these things are not really alternatives, but I don't fault the author, the author because it's okay. So, <clears throat> The first one they talk about is a decision room. You know, a specialized room where all this takes place. In other words, it's a room that has all the little buzzer things set up like I just described. You know, it's got a projector, it's got a screen. You know, it's got a podium for the moderator and, and people sitting in a semicircle or a round table or something. And you know, it's a specialized room just for doing these group decision supports. Now, is that an alternative to a GSS? Well, no, but hey, I'll cut them a little bit of slack. So some sort of a system it's already set up, cool. Um, local area decision network, it's kind of sort of like the same thing, but you're doing it over the wire. And then teleconferencing, okay, that, that clearly is an alternative. And this wide area decision networking, like, uh, okay, I, and I just break people up into smaller chunks and, and uh, you know, we just pick a time and everyone sits at their own desk rather than going to a room to do this. Okay, that's about it. Okay, so we have completed the end of the chapter. And we'll see you guys again in some future chapter.